it's the March um, a Swift board meeting. Can I ask everyone to go on to mute? It will just help with the acoustics. Um, and as ever, it's um, a delight for me to start off with the Going the Extra Mile um, Award winners. Um, and so we've got two Going the Extra Mile Award winners. First of all, Fiona, I can see on the screen. So uh, Fiona, you're our individual uh, manager um, and Fiona manages our cardiology uh, services. So uh, thank you for your day in, day out hard work, Fiona. But this is a really lovely uh, commendation. Um, and so um, you were nominated um, after a member of staff for going out of your way to drive an hour and a half to collect a dog whose owner was on the end of life. And it was their dying wish to see their dog. After a few hours, Fiona then drove the dog back to the kennels, making it a three hour round trip. The nominator wrote, Fiona demonstrated such care and compassion and always places her patients at the heart of everything she does. Fiona's actions made a huge impact on the patient and it was so important in the last few days of life. The nominator also said, Fiona is a humble and diligent staff member and made me proud to have her as part of the team. Fiona showed how important the small things are in life, despite the pressures and how busy people are, and shows how the small things remain a focus and are often the most important. Fiona, that is an absolutely wonderful uh, commendation and um, I'm absolutely delighted you are our individual winner of the Game the Extra Mile Award. And as a dog lover, I want you when I'm an end of life to go and collect my Rhodesian Ridgeback and Boxer and see the chaos they would cause um, at end of life. But thank you very much. Big round of applause. And um, then we've got the team winner. And uh, the team winner is our emergency department. And if ever there was a team who day in, day out go the extra mile, it's the emergency department. But um, the, the nomination is actually quite short, so I'm going to expand it a bit. Uh, but the nominator wrote, all the staff in the emergency department strive to keep our patients safe in a challenging department where safety is key. With patients attending the department in huge volume, the staff managed to keep them safe. They're an effective team under, under unprecedented pressure and managed to keep patients safe, receive excellent patient care, feedback and support each other during the shifts. Now, that that really doesn't, in my view, it's a lovely to have the nomination, but doesn't do justice to the phenomenal work that our ED and EDEC team do day in, day out. So I want to make that um, clear. And it's great to see you there. I'm just going to give you a wave. I can see some of you in the corner of my screen because there's other stuff that you've been doing. It's the innovation that comes out. Of, of the ED team, which I find remarkable. We've had the medical day case unit opening last summer, which has had a really big impact and now sees, I think it's over 180 plus patients um, a, a week over just five days. Um, it's the collaboration of things like Frouty with the West Midlands Ambulance Service, which is a really great innovation and makes a real difference to those frail elderly going back into their houses. Um, We've opened up the minor, minor injuries unit back in Stratford, which has caused operational pressures. Um, but it's and I, I attend the finance and performance meetings and Rachel attends on your behalf. It's just a level of innovation and commitment you guys show. I really can't thank you enough on behalf of the citizens of Warwickshire. You make us all really proud and you do save, save lives day in, day out. And I know there are a number of people on the call who over the last few months, including myself, have had to use the ED department and have been so proud and frankly, so grateful to live in Warwickshire compared to some other places. You are absolute stars and a credit to us as an organisation. Um, and I'm pleased that Amanda Pritchard and news uh, uh, companies come and visit us and see the stuff you're doing because you're fantastic. Big round of applause to our ED department. Can you send the back, love back to all of your colleagues? Because I know there's just a few of you on the call, but if you can make sure you send the love back to our, your colleagues and our colleagues, that would be wonderful. Keep up the great work, guys. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very, very much. 
Now, to members of the public, um, as I said, lovely to see you all. Um, this is a very long uh, board pack we have before us. It's almost 700 pages, which is um, uh, pretty gargantuan and I think it's the biggest we've had, which reflects the fact we didn't have a board in January. We had the three board meeting in February um, and we have a number of business cases coming to us in our endeavours to capture as much capital um, towards the end of this financial year as possible. So um, I will keep things moving at a pace because um, 700 pages is a lot. So with your forbearance, we will get going. So we have apologies of absence from Charles Ashton. So Bhaskar, again, lovely to see you. Apologies from Sophie Gilks and uh, Jenny, thank you for deputising. And uh, this morning, um, our Interim Director of Nursing, Sarah Moffat, was taken unwell. So Sarah's not with us, but Anne Coyle is going to handle that bit of her agenda. So um, a, a fair number of apologies. And finally, apologies from Yasmin. Um, the other thing to remember is today is the last bald um, uh, day for Anne Coyle, who's been an absolute star and joined us, I think, in 2013. Um, and she's off to uh, become chief executive of the Mercy University Hospital in Cork. Um, so going back near to home, uh, we're delighted for you, Anne. You, you leave with our love and best wishes and enormous thanks for the phenomenal contribution you've made ever since you've joined, um, leading all of our community work and integration with partners, which is pathfinding, and it's, it's down to your leadership. So thank you. So... Um, we will be making in due course a public announcement on our new uh, managing director so um, that will be made clear um, over the next week or so any new declarations of interest please raise a digital hand okay so we'll move on we've got a series of um, minutes to handle the minutes of the meeting held on the 7th of december if there are any points of accuracy could you please raise a digital hand I can't see any digital hands raised, so I'll take those as accurate. Um, in terms of the action points arising, um, we go to page 15 of our pack, and the first was on the integrated performance report regarding the Warwick Transformation Programme to be submitted to a board um, at a future date. Um, that's an ongoing work programme, and um, uh, an update is going to be provided, I think, Anne, um, on an ongoing basis, so thank you for that. Also on in the integrated performance report, uh, Gertie to confirm where staff have been recruited to outside of the listed nursing figures. Uh, that was done and uh, sent to Simon. Thank you, Gertie. Then Vasca to provide evidence to myself with regard to the post-COVID death rate within the trust uh, being higher than the five-year average. Um, that was done. Thank you again, uh, Vasca. And then on the six monthly update on trust performance against national guidance, um, Bhaskar to undertake a deep dive in intelligence conveyancing. Um, again, that was done. Thank you very much, Bhaskar. That was appreciated. And then a, a couple of questions from uh, governor colleagues. Um, Harkamel to respond um, outside the meeting with regard to the function of the scanning bureau. Um, you did that, Harkamel, I believe. Thank you very much. And then Harkham also to continue with discussions with um, the CMO and CNO regarding lower level risks in order to obtain further bed capacity. Um, that was undertaken in a quite stressful way during the course of December and January. So very well done on that. Any matters arising that you feel I've missed? OK, so I think we're then on to the foundation, um, the three board meeting of the Foundation Group uh, boards held on the 1st of February. Now, any points of accuracy on these minutes? Please raise a digital hand. OK, I can't see a digital hand raised. So we just had a couple of action points there, which were on page 31. The first was um, regarding financial planning for 23-24, which we had a session on this morning um, as a board in our workshop. Uh, about productivity progress being monitored uh, to be added to the Foundation Group Board schedule of business. That will be done. Thank you, Chelsea. 
And then on the group analytics update uh, to include services data as part of their future project work. And Jane and Hark are going to do that. Um, any matters arising that colleagues feel I've missed? OK, so we then duly move into my update on the integrated um, uh, care partnership meeting, which occurred um, uh, the week before last. And the integrated care partnership brings together the ICS um, and various different other parties, for example, Health Watcher there and others. It was a really another very, very good meeting. Um, and uh, there is a real sense of wanting to work together. Um, the ICS set out its vision and strategic uh, priorities, which had been publicised in December 2022. So members of the public should be able to find that on their website. Um, they are currently working on a five year joint forward plan, which needs to be completed by June 2023. They identified three broad areas of priority, one around prioritising prevention, secondly about improving access to health and care, and three, tackling immediate system pressures, which I think are absolutely the right priorities. And there's ongoing work on developing practical targets. At the meeting, I made quite a plea on the need to hear the voice of our citizen more uh, than we're currently hearing. And there's some great work that's been done by um, an individual called Rose Unwins. Um, but I do want to uh, hear more from um, Health Watch in Warwickshire. So I have reached out to Chris Baines, who's Chief Executive of Health Watch Warwickshire, to invite him to come and join our board workshop every three months or so uh, to brief all of our board on uh, the voice of the citizen, if you like. We obviously have our friends and families um, data, uh, but I want to broaden the church of um, data and soft data that we receive. And Chris, I think, will do an outstanding job in that regard. So that's my update on the integrated care partnership. Uh, Glenn sort of covers some of it more in his uh, session on um, his uh, board report. So if there are no questions on that, we'll move on to the um, uh, board schedule of business for 23-24. Um, Sarah? Thanks, Russell. Um, so this document maps out the business that the board should expect to see over the next financial year but obviously it could vary depends on um, timing so it's there for the board's consideration and approval thank you thank you very much sir always depressing when you see your life mapped out to uh, the middle of 2024 um any questions or perspectives on the board's schedule of business if you're not happy to approve please raise a digital hand Duly approved. Thank you very much. And then we move on to the annual review of Board of Directors standing orders. Back with you, Sarah. Thank you. So um, a review has been undertaken in line with the annual review timetable. There's no proposed amendments at this stage because there was a considerable detailed review taking place last year as part of the full constitution. So again, it's for the board's consideration and then any proposed amendments will submit to the Council of Governors on the 11th of May. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you very much, Sarah. Any questions or perspectives on the annual review of board of directors standing orders? Please raise a digital hand. OK, if you're not happy to approve, please raise a digital hand. And then continuing the sort of annual review process, we're on to the annual review of standing financial instructions and scheme of delegation. Um, uh, over to you, Kim. Uh, thank you, Chair. So again, this is the annual review. Uh, the uh, paper details some of the changes uh, in relation to the standing financial instructions and the scheme of delegation. We've taken uh, the audit committee members through the uh, changes and they were happy to, rec uh, to approve and recommend uh, that these be approved by the board. I'm just asking the board to approve those. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, and uh, Richard, uh, any comments from you as chair of the audit committee? Uh, Richard, you're on mute. 
we approved it on the 8th of February, went through it. It's mainly just changes to, to uh, names uh, 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 going through it. So there was nothing really of major concern. OK, great. Thank you, Richard. So based on what him and Richard have said, any questions from colleagues, please raise a digital hand. If you're not happy to approve, please uh, raise a digital hand. Duly approved. Thank you very much. So we're then on. And we're already at page 151 of the board pack. You'll be pleased to know the annual review of policy review group terms of reference. And Carl, over to you. Thank you, Chair. So the uh, proposed amendments are included, uh, are shown as track changes, and they're therefore um, for um, ratification by today's board. OK, that's great. And um, thank you. Any questions on the Annual review of policy review group terms of reference, please raise a digital hand. And if you're not happy to approve, please raise a digital hand. OK, thank you. So we're then on to, um, I think, a great piece of work that we've been doing over a number of months, um, which is the Trust Strategy Refresh. And um, uh, really nice within the pack, starting at page 158, and the Helping People Live Healthier, Happier Lives document. Uh, Jenny Bannon, over to you. What would you like to pull out of this? Thank you. Um, so really pleased to, to bring the document back for consideration and approval today. Um, so the covering paper just takes you through the process we, we've gone through um, right back from the workshop last year, which uh, a great number of people attended, and um, foundation group board last month as well. Um, following that, we've done um, public engagement and made some amends to the document, which you can also see in the paper, namely um, in terms of how we plan to measure delivery of the strategy through our um, trust objectives. Um, so, yeah, sub subsequent to uh, approval, the next steps will be to um, publish the strategy and consider how we best go about embedding within the trust and um, in conjunction with our partners. So those are the points I wanted to pull out. No, that's great. Thank you, Jenny. And it's quite radical. You know, some of our pillars like um, the domiciliary care actions and being a very flexible employer, I think, are strategically very important for us going forwards. Um, questions and perspectives, uh, Glenn? Yeah, I think it's a great piece of work. So, so well done to Jenny and the comms team. Um, and we've shared this already with, with some of our stakeholders and, and those who've read it have, have found it to be, uh, you know, a, a really good articulation of where we're going and, and, and aligned to it. And um, the, the other bit to add to this is that we we've done this review in all three parts of the group and and uh, there is still really strong alignment between all three members of the group and so when we take this forward there's the strength of the group in in um, in sharing best practice in order to deliver against these uh, ambitious plans no absolutely and that ability that we have as a um foundation group to compare and contrast progress on the delivery of those ambitious plans. Any questions or perspectives? We've all been through this as a board uh, a number of times. Please raise a hand if you have. And you will miss the delivery of it. Um, but I'm sure your successor will, um, uh, will uh, take it forward with real momentum. It's an exciting time. OK, so if you're not happy to approve, please raise a digital hand. Duly approved. Thank you, Jenny, for all your hard work. Thank you, Mary Powell and all your team for uh, making it um, work as well as it does. So I think we're then on to the final trust objectives for 23-24. Again, we've discussed these a number of times, but Glenn, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. So, yeah, so these are down as final because we we saw a draft of them when we we met with the the, the other two boards of the group um, recently. Um, they're structured in, in in line with the strategy, so it's good that we've signed the strategy off in in the previous uh, item. Um, the things I just wanted to flag, obviously, the the, the background to this is we we held our, our normal uh, roundtable with our governors in the autumn, and that helped to influence the things that are in here as well as the, the, some of the national directives that that, that we have. But uh, a lot of what you see in here are the things that we want to do locally to progress the implementation of the strategy. 
Um, it's structured in line with the big moves, plus there's a, an additional section at, at the end that talks about some of the things that are outside the big moves, including some of the productivity moves. Um, I think there's only one thing I just wanted to add following the discussions that we had at Group Strategy Committee this week, is that the under the being a very flexible employer uh, objective, we, when we get into the detail of looking at some of the measures on this, and when we look at our board assurance framework, we're going to include within this the agency reduction programme uh, that we're focused on. And that's more of a quality initiative, actually, than a financial initiative, but, but that will be one of the underpinning measures of, of success in this area. So I'm happy to take any questions. No, thank you, Glenn. And uh, for members of the public, uh, the board had a session on risk appetite this morning and um, on a risk training session as well, where we had, I think, in total about 75 members of the senior team in SWIFT uh, uh, being trained on, on risk management. But on the risk appetite side, we um, discussed each of the levels of risk appetite we had on each of these different areas. Um, any questions or perspectives to Glenn? Uh, again, we have seen these a few times before. And if you're not happy to approve, could you please raise a digital hand? OK, team, we're biting into lots of stuff, and that's even before we get into the capital a bit later on. So thank you very much. So I think we are then on to page 178 of our pack and the chief executives report. Glenn, it's been, again, a very, very busy time. What would you like to put out? Thank you, Chair. So, yeah, it's a it's a big board pack and actually quite a big chief executives report this time. So apologies for that. I won't go through all of it. Um, I'll just pull out some highlights. Before I do that, though, I, I'd just like to add uh, my appreciation to to Anne, um, who's um, who's been a fantastic managing director here. She's really helped to transform the focus of the organisation. So she'll be missed, but there'll be more to come in the future. So I um, just want to highlight a couple of things. So firstly, on the clinical trials update, I'm, I'm really impressive to see the work that Donna Walsh and the team have put in um, to uh, really put us on the map in terms of research, moving from an organisation that was doing broadly the amount of research that it, that it kind of should for its size to a situation where we're absolutely punching above our weight and second in the region on the number of patients in clinical trials. So really great to see that and also really appreciate the support from the Rigby Foundation in funding that post on an ongoing basis to continue that, that work. Um, the, I then refer to the delivery plan for recovering urgent emergency care. Uh, lots of detail in here. It's, I suppose it's a little disappointing that the plan starts with more beds, more ambulances. Um, but there's some kind of necessary uh, uh, realisation in there that, that we need to do something to, to make things safe. The more important plan, though, for me, is the implementation of best practice across the NHS much of which we've been doing in the group. In fact, a lot of which we, we've helped to, to shape within the group, but actually doing things in a smarter way rather than just building more capacity is the way we're going to manage urgent and emergency care moving forward. And that, that's not just within the hospital setting, that's out of hospital using virtual wards, etc. So all of that is covered in this plan, which I'm, uh, I, I'm pleased to see is in there and, and uh, we will keep updating as we move forward. Um, I will not go through every item. The financial framework for 23-24 is one that I just wanted to flag. Um, broadly flat funding, um, some, some big assumptions in that flat funding as well, including inflation at 5.5%, including a 2% pay award allocation. So if those things change, I hope that uh, we will receive additional funding as an NHS. Um, but the the framework as it exists at the moment is currently causing a lot of concern and as systems pull together their financial plans, there's, a, there's, there's quite a few large deficits in systems being looked at. And we'll be looking at that a little bit more as indeed we did this morning with Kim 
um, but um, it's uh, it's something that is going to need a lot of focus this year. Really pleased though to see the return of payment by results. Um, been pushing for that. I think that's the only way that we will get the NHS to deliver more elective activity. Um, it's it'll be necessary for the next two or three years. Then ideally we then will move back to a situation where population funding dominates and, and we manage within allocations for each of our places. Um, uh, the, there's then um, around urgent care, there's my favourite chart, which uh, has been updated, which just shows that age profile uh, of, of Warwick Hospital, which is not which is not different to your average district general hospital, but it really helps to focus that managing urgent emergency care is about managing complex, uh, often frail elderly patients uh, and to consider the whole patient rather than the individual specialty is the way that we've been able to manage that better uh, and, and obviously is linked into the plan that I described earlier. There's the ICS update we've touched on. There's uh, a little bit of a focus which is timely on the emergency department who received our Going the Extra Mile award earlier um, uh, and some of the things that have gone into uh, reshaping the service, some of the things that we've trialled over the last uh, uh, winter period, the frailty ambulance response, uh, the medical, medical day case unit, all of which have, have, have helped us to continue to deliver safe, effective care. Uh, and then I list the GEM Award winners at the end, which we announced at the start. Happy to take questions, Chairman. Thank you very much, Glenn. Any questions or perspectives to Glenn? Um, Glenn, I think this is the first time since um, uh, of the Swift board um, that we've met since uh, you attended the number 10 uh, summit. So just on behalf of the citizens of Warwickshire, thank you very much for your uh, work at a national level and uh, behind the scenes to try and help the NHS achieve its potential. Your, um, impact is very um, relevant, important and helpful. Uh, thank you. But it does go to show the sort of challenges the system I think is generally having at the moment. And um, as we recognise, and we'll come on to the integrated performance report in a second, we recognise despite the phenomenal efforts of executive directors and our frontline teams, we're still not delivering the level of performance that historically we've been proud to deliver. And um, despite doing better than others, um, it is very much our determination as a team to get back to where we were, uh, despite the phenomenal increases in demand, which we'll touch on in the next few moments. Anything else for Glenn? So I think then we are on to the integrated performance report, which you're going to introduce for us, Anne. Thank you very much. No, thank you, Chair. So by way of introduction, you've 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 touched on in terms of the, the high acuity of patient population, uh, which really resulted in, um, as reported in the Chief Nursing Officer's report, the high number of resuscitation calls. And again, just draw attention to the high reporting uh, month for um, serious incidents of which no underlying themes uh, were identified. But the reduction in medic medication incidents and falls for 1,000 bed days alongside the improved patient um, experience metrics was re really pleasing to see. And I'll touch on it later in the nurse uh, staffing report, um, the improved, our improved uh, recruitment and, and reduction in our vacancy levels there, I'm sure has had a factor in that. In the Chief Operating Officers, just a couple of points, our ED performance uh, for January was 66.6. That's a significant improvement on December's uh, low and it really moved the trust forward from 43rd position to 27th for type 1 activity. We had no patients waiting over 104 weeks and work underway to treat all patients over 78 weeks by the end of March. Our cancer referrals continue to remain high, um, but it's pleasing to note the progress in, for example, in moving straight to testing pathways for colorectal and the work that's underway to really share learning from our tumour sites that are delivering well. Chief People Officer flags the work underway to streamline to reduce particularly our time to hire and the work underway to embed new values and our behaviour framework. 
Um, in month 10, the Chief Finance Officer flags, the you know, although the operational um, challenges, the key point, though, is that we've maintained our year to date break even uh, position against a 2.5 million um, surplus. I'm sure Kim will go into um, the reasons and the rationale for that later. And finally, not strictly part of the integrated performance dashboard, but to thank you very much for your kind words. It's been great to be part of the SWIFT board for almost seven years and wish everybody well going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions to Anne or do we want to dive into the individual uh, details? OK, so we'll start off then with quality and safety and uh, Bhaskar, anything you'd particularly like to pull out of the report? Thanks, Chair. I think the, the, the acknowledgement that we are noticing an upward trend in our shimmy mortality data, but we're still within acceptable uh, range, but we're already doing a deep dive and in particular pneumonia related death seems to come out as a worrying trend and we've already uh, commissioned a couple of audits both at the elderly cohort as well as the under 75 to see what lessons we can learn. We're also working in partnership with Y Valley in trying to refine our learning from deaths uh, framework beyond just the SJRs and the coroners but even significant trends outside of thresholds to uh, cut through the SJR or whatever other thresholds there may be. So I think I would like to get the assurance that we are cited to this trend and we're working hard to see what remedies we can put in place that might include some clinical, but a little bit of admin coding, tidying up amongst other things. Thank you. That's great, Pascal. There does seem to be a lot of respiratory uh, nasty stuff going around to use the layman's language is that your sense as well Pascal it's been a that's tough correct day. yeah it is acute bronchitis pneumonia coming up as the top two certainly in trend as well as numbers and yeah and ironically even though the average age of our the initial preliminary deep dive does suggest that we have an older cohort which I think you referenced to earlier but for some reason the comorbidity index is not reflecting their alleged complexity that we would expect so which is where we're investing in that coding side of things to see what may be some of the remediable factors there but yeah respiratory seems to be the theme here okay great thanks Pascal. and Anne, on behalf of sarah anything you wanted to add in terms of c diff or just take it as well yeah, I'll take those all as read, um, but there was a requirement that Sarah provide the board with an annual statement of compliance with same-sex guidance, and, and she was able to confirm and, uh, that during the year that we breached the same-sex guidance on two occasions, affecting seven patients, and both occasions were a time of intense operational uh, pressure, um, but that we've been able to strengthen operational guidance on the back of these cases to help prevent uh, any future breaches. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions or perspectives to um, uh, Basker or Anne on quality and safety? Glenn? I was just going to comment, if I may, on the friends and family test, the fact that the performance improved during the month of January, which is which is which was an incredibly busy month, um, uh, is, is real testimony to our to our clinical teams. And quite quite often when I get uh, emails or letters from members of the public, they they always start by saying it was incredibly busy, uh, but your staff were amazing. Uh, and it's it's really great to see that's coming out in the friends and family test. So great, thank you. And I've had some very um, supportive feedback from governors who have been on ward visits about the level of um, energy uh, around um, the trust um, in, in terms of uh, quality, safety and um, transformation. Any other points? I just wanted to have a, a call out um, to our midwifery team on some of the great work they do. Um, in particular, um, our bereavement services um, in midwifery, uh, where um, I think since Bessie Scrivens got involved, um, we've, we've been doing some really um, very important work helping families who lose uh, a beloved um, uh, baby um, over 20 weeks. So I know Sarah's looking at um, our work, uh, able to support families um, when term ends below 20 weeks, but um, Bessie Scrivens and all of the midwifery team do some fantastic work supporting um, uh, our parents who are, are, are blessed enough to have lovely babies born, but also 
parents who suffer the loss of a, a beloved child. Um, so if colleagues are happy to move on, uh, we'll then go over to you, Harkema, and how are you seeing things operationally? Um, so the report um, relates to January um, and as we sort of alluded to, December, the end of December specifically was really, really challenging for this, for this organisation um, and we faced pressure that I don't think any of us sort of could have expected and then starting January off um, along that same vein, the first couple of weeks were really, really hard but I'm really proud of how the organisation recovered and we attempted to do some quite brave things. So um, I'll take the report as read, but the, the things I wanted to kind of draw out were around the trial of the same day emergency care um, pilot. So we ran a pilot for a week where we extended the hours of all our same day emergency care. So um, uh, surgical assessment unit, paediatric assessment unit, the acute medical unit, frailty, um, and really committed to not bedding into those areas overnight. And we saw some record levels of performance um, over the past couple of years, certainly. Um, nothing close to as high as we were, but certainly a massive improvement compared to where we were. Um, and I think it gave the organisation quite a lot of confidence and a really good reminder on, you know, what it is possible when we all rally together and really, really try our hardest. Um, and everybody just went above and beyond. So I'm really, really um, proud to be able to talk to that. And we've taken some of that learning and we're going to plan to do another um, extended um, uh, SDEP PDSA, uh, Plan Do Study Act, just taking some of that learning and really refining that to make sure that when we make a case for investment, we're asking for um, the, the right thing. And I'll talk a bit more about winter in a minute. From an elective perspective, we were really busy in January. I'm really proud that we didn't cancel any electives um, and the volume of activity that we were doing in January, I, I think, was really phenomenal against the backdrop of the emergency pressures. And overall, we hit 102% of the financial value compared to 1920. Um, and that is sort of no mean feat and a large increase of that um, related to our inpatients. Um, you know, so to safeguard those beds alongside all of the other operational pressures, um, I'm really, really proud of that. We remain on track to um, eliminate our 78 um, week breaches and um, the pressure point of, um, within trying to achieve that has been around orthodontics. And um, that's always a service I think that probably yeah, does worry me, you know, in terms of like the demand coming through and the lack of, um, you know, suitable alternative providers for patients. And then a lot of our patients do travel, you know, quite a long way to receive orthodontic treatment. And um, it's just, you know, I kind of wanted to flag that here because it's, you know, it's often sort of unsung and people don't always think about the significance of that service on these patients who are often, are often accessing that as a first, you know, experience of the NHS. We've really started to struggle with diagnostics, and that's been brought about by a significant, significant impact in non-obstetrical obstetric ultrasound. The team are working for a plan to try and um, clear some of that, but that is due to a historic um, level of demand um, coming through that. And our waiting list at the moment is at an all-time high, over 8,200. We had a very tiny um, drop in cancer referrals over December, but that was still higher than the average of the past five years. And January was the highest January that we've had for five years in terms of cancer, di um, cancer referrals. And that's predominantly driven by colorectal. Um, and I talk in my report around the colorectal team introducing a straight to test pathway, which I think is very brave, um, it, you know, to take that volume of patients and reorder them and really try and get that pathway in the right order um, is sort of, is a really incredible piece of work. Um, and I kind of, um, was willing them to have a bit of respite or demand going back to the average that we, we think for. Um, but, you know, we have seen a significant increase um, in January. So at least those patients are going through in the right way and it'll be continuing to, um, you know, refine that pathway and try and make sure that we have the capacity to match that sustained demand because colorectal really is our pressure point. Um, in terms of my deep dive, I have presented a bit of a look back for winter. Um, so I've presented before around the plan that we had to um, try and have a strategic focus for the first few months of the year and then moving on into um, a more operational, as it's happening, real time look at um, what's what's going on. And I think that really helped us. You know, we really went in with data driven um, packs and uh, quite a good set of analysis of where we where we thought we'd end up. And broadly, from a bed perspective, we were there or there about the problem um, occurred when demand was so far outside what we expected, combined with the flu and COVID numbers hitting at the same time, which wasn't modelled for because it wasn't necessarily seen to the extent that we, we saw it. And just managing some of the operational pressures of, you know, making sure that we have the beds in the right place and we're trying to keep all our patients safe. 
whilst we are um, receiving ambulances from you know all around the patch um, and going into super surge capacity over a bank holiday, planning for industrial action. I mean, you name it, it sort of happened. Um, and I think the organisation responded really, really well. Everybody rallied round. We put in um, Silver Plus meetings. So the organisation was meeting three times a day um, with lots of execs on the meeting. And I think that gave a lot of assurance to all of our staff um, in terms of everybody truly understanding the pressure that people were under. Um, you know, when we were on the news and um, lots of people were saying lots of lo very lovely things about um, the organisation, um, which I think was a, a very well needed mood boost. And in terms of um, what we're doing next, I think some of the things around stepping up silver pluses when we need them and really responding to the organisation when we know that they need us to wrap around them and provide that support is certainly something that we've learned and we can mobilise that now very quickly. And I'm very grateful to all of my colleagues for coming to those meetings with me and providing that support to our to our teams and because I know it's really um, appreciated. I've talked about the um, same day emergency care PDSA and we're looking to extend that and, and take that over a long period of time and um, see um, where else is um, learning and really take some of this planning to make sure that we are as robust as possible for our industrial action plans and our upcoming bank holiday um, plans. But really I would say that overall um, from our, my winter planning, my my biggest reflection is it's really important to keep a, to create a space where people can be open and honest and just put forward any idea that we may never have tried before but you know times are, are changing and you have to sort of try that and I think that's been certainly my my takeaway um, from what has been quite a difficult time. So really great Harkamel and um, you know one of the things that impressed me in the Valley of Despair which was December and uh, the start of January was just the level of um, commitment and agility of the teams and the positive, let's find a solution attitude. Rachel's on the call, um, she'll be back with us later, but Rachel for me was a great uh, example of that. And I've been really impressed in the F&P meetings, which I know uh, Kim chairs, at the level of energy in each of the teams, despite all of these phenomenal pressures, We've got and we haven't really touched on the junior doctors strike but we've got that challenge to come um, but it's the willingness to try and find solutions which I think is great and a lot of that comes from your leadership so thank you very much. Um, questions or perspectives to Harkamel? Okay so um, Gertie has had to um, leave the building so to speak in a true Elvis way so Elva, you are standing in for Elvis, so to speak. And uh, what would you like to pull out of the people, I think? Yeah, thank you. Um, so just a few things to highlight in terms of the report. We've undertaken quite um, a lot of work in terms of streamlining and speeding up our recruitment process, which has seen a very positive impact on our time to hire. Um, we also have um, proactive recruitment plans in place with a number of career days and recruitment events over the 12, over the next coming 12 months, which will be really positive. Um, sickness still remains above trust target, but there is a range of health and wellbeing support we have in place, and we have got targeted work that continues with the divisions to support managers and, and manage staff, including a range of refresher training, um, to assist in developing those manager skills so that they can support staff um, if they're off sick. Um, and also, as um, Anne touched upon around the trust uh, behaviours launching in January, um, we've got a plan over the 12 months to embed and refresh uh, our refreshed values and, and behaviours with support from comms and OD colleagues. Thank you, Alva. Any questions or perspectives um, to Alva on behalf of Gertie Glenn? Don't worry, Alva, it's not a question. I just wanted to comment positively on the improvements in the time to hire performance and, and a kind of more modern approach to that. It's also something I just wanted to add that, that uh, in 2003, uh, a cohort of Filipino nurses came over to, to South Warwickshire to join us. Um, and um, this next week we celebrate their 20th anniversary of being in the trust in great members of staff work incredibly hard really skilled um, and um, it's been great to see them settle into the local community and contribute to the performance of the trust so a personal thank you to them no point well made thanks glenn and any other questions to 
Oh, it hasn't quite sort of um, got into the narrative, but I, I have asked before to talk about the growth in FTE um, since 2019-20. Uh, we, we talk we, all the time we talk about uh, vacancies. We do talk about the number of um, staff increase um, in 21-22, but I, I want to understand the percentage increase in staff since 1920. I just want to make okay. that a bit more visible. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, colleagues, happy to move on. So, Kim, um, the money has been a real challenge this year. Um, how would you summarise things as we are just four weeks away from the year end? Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. So, as I, and I mentioned earlier, in terms of the uh, month 10 position, we are reporting a break even position against a two and a half million pound uh, surplus plan. Uh, we've been reviewing the, um, you know, despite that, that's great performance given the operational uh, challenges really that the organisation has been uh, managing. And, you know, that, that does have an impact really in terms of our expenditure run rates. Uh, in order to ensure that the organisation is uh, safe uh, to uh, to provide care for our patients. Um, in terms of um, moving forward, uh, we've been reviewing our forecast. Uh, we had uh, planned on a three million pound surplus on the assumption that we received uh, income for reimbursement of uh, beds uh, at uh, at Seru and also so, uh, funding for endoscopy following the capital investment uh, required for our community diagnostic centres. However, uh, we've now had confirmation that NHSE are uh, no longer able to fund on the basis of the business case that we had submitted. So we're short of funding of about uh, 900,000 for the, um, the community diagnostic uh, centres. Uh, but the ICB have also now indicated that they are unlikely to fund the uh, several beds as well, which means that our forecast uh, of three million surplus now is unlikely to be uh, achieved. Um, so so the, the, we're going to revise the forecast to deliver just on a, on a, on a break even uh, position as a result of uh, those two uh, changes. Uh, we're also currently managing uh, mitigations, um, you know, moving forward in terms of uh, the February position. Uh, we've also had uh, experienced some um, increased expenditure run rates as a result of the operational challenges. And we've got some uh, risks uh, moving into December with further strike action as well. But still feel confident that we can deliver a break even uh, out term for this financial year. Other things I wanted to uh, bring to attention, given the fact that we didn't have a board in January, we all note that the uh, capital uh, programme has increased significantly, uh, and that's as a result of the fact that we were successfully awarded funding for the elective hub and also uh, uh, the uh, urgent treatment centre. Um, but uh, we are required to spend that money by the end of the financial year, but given the late notification, we are uh, we, we've got plans to carry that forward into next financial year and we've got a, a paper in the confidential uh, board discussion uh, around how we as an organization can can do that um, the other thing to note uh, glenn's obviously touched on the priorities and operational planning guidance for next year and the financial framework we're currently working through those allocations and we've got more work to do with the divisions uh, it remains challenging for us as an organisation as well as the system in terms of coming up with a uh, uh, overarching uh, plan, uh, given the fact that lots of other ICSs are reporting deficit plans. Uh, again, we've got a draft financial plan that is going to be discussed at the confidential uh, board later. We also had a bit of a workshop session on it uh, earlier today. So those are the key things that I wanted to highlight uh, to members. That's great, um, Kim. So at its simplest, we would have made three million if we'd got the 900,000 for the um, CDC and the money for the CERU beds, because we're not getting that money, we're back to break even, despite all of the challenges of December and January, which I think is a 
an extremely commendable result. Just before I invite further questions or perspectives, I, I think it is now the responsibility of boards to talk about the system finances. Um, uh, help us to understand very quickly and broadly, Kim, what the systems finances are looking like. If we're a break even, where's everyone else? So the original plan was um, so the original plan was a break even plan across the system. Uh, at a point in December, the plan had moved, and the, uh, the uh, we understood that uh, it was moving to a deficit plan of just under six million deficit. But more recent um, uh, update is that the system will still deliver a break break even plan, despite uh, the fact that our surplus, uh, our position might be moving as well. Okay. So, so does that mean good. everyone's at break even, or does it mean some are break even or a bit better um, and some are? So the one or uh, the. In terms of the individual organisations, uh, UHEW will be reporting, I believe, uh, around £15 million deficit. OK, fine. Thank you. Um, any questions or perspectives to Kim? Uh, Kim, I'd just like to put on record my thanks to you and particularly, I guess, Jenny's team and the operational team. It is a bit of a nonsense the way this capital is suddenly released towards the end of the year and everyone has to scurry about to produce business plans. Um, I know an awful lot of work has been done very, very quickly uh, to make sure we can capture that capital, which is absolutely the right thing to do for Warwickshire citizens. Um, but it is just frustrating that things aren't properly planned, not by us, by our colleagues elsewhere, um, to allow it just to be a smoother process. Glenn, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, just from picking up on that point, actually, the, the carry forward of capital loss, we'll, we'll discuss it in our, our confidential meeting for those members of the public watching. It's something we've discussed, the mechanism through which we're going to do this with our governors and have the support of council of governors. And, uh, and we appreciate that support. OK, team, thank you, Kim. Um, look forward to seeing how next year uh, works out. Um, it's clearly going to be a tough year, given some of the assumptions that we are looking at. Um, so we're on then to the quarterly safe staffing report. Um, Anne, you are Sarah Moffat. What would you like to pull out? Yeah, so this report provides the board the overall assurance of compliance um, with national guidance on safe, safe staffing for nursing, maternity and allied health professionals from November 22 to January 23. And Sarah, and we, we've touched on it earlier, and I think all of us uh, would want to start by paying tribute to colleagues across SWIFT in, in terms of the, the, the challenges and the demands. Um, and, and, you know, areas where staffing has really been stretched. But against that backdrop, and Glenn's touched on it in terms of really strong performance on a friends and family uh, test, Sarah was keen to draw out three themes that she wanted to pull out from the data that she, she flagged in terms of really positive and good news for our uh, patients and staff. And those are the quality matrix metrics, you know, the fact that she's able to report such positive quality metrics in January's performance report is related to our improved um, staffing described in the report. The second is flow and the hard work uh, to maintain flow, uh, which Hartnell touched on as part of the as, as part of our winter look back has described a positive impact on safe staffing as we've managed largely to work within our funded bed base. And thirdly, the vacancy gap being reduced. The report describes the lowest vacancy gap for many months and improvements in almost every area of AHP, nursing and midwifery workforce, including, and it's great to see some of our staffing risks which have removed, been removed off the risk register. The report also highlights a lot of plans, innovations being taken forward, and Sarah has, has identified um, a couple to really bring to the board's attention. The first is um, the corporate nursing teams under Sarah's leadership are about to commence the uh, next round of acuity staffing reviews. And this time, and it's really great to see that this will include the national tools for community nursing. Just also that's been in the news this week around the national report, a complete describing psychological harm to staff working in ED due to the national pressures. And therefore it's really timely to draw the board's attention to the fact that we have commenced a detailed piece of work, our ED programme, aimed at supporting our teams to continue taking a range of innovations and improvements forward. 
And as part of that work, the staffing report details a range of staffing initiatives which have really strengthened the practice environment and safe staffing in ED, which is which is really positive uh, to see. And she and, and Sarah wanted to finish off by highlighting uh, the completion of ward accreditation programme with some fantastic results. And there is a plan to recognise and celebrate these achievements at our Care Excellent Foundation Group conference in May. Thank you, Chair. That's great. Thank you, Anne. Um, any questions or perspectives to um, Sarah and Anne in, on her behalf? Um, I, I, again, um, we are looking forward to seeing Fiona Burton uh, rejoin us as uh, our Director of Nursing. Um, and it's a shame uh, Sarah isn't with us. She's staying with us um, in a different capacity, uh, driving our Excel programme. Uh, but I'd just like to put on public record my enormous thanks to Sarah Moffat. I think she's been a, a wonderful addition to us as a team, and I can't thank her enough for her hard work during what has been a very, very difficult six months. OK, we'll move on then, just keeping the pace going. Um, we're up to, I think, uh, let me get my pages right, about page 200 and, uh, 10 of our board pack and we're on to the maternity governance report for quarter three. Um, Lorraine, just before you joined, I was um, praising the maternity team for their phenomenal work uh, month in, month out. Another very busy month, I know, but particularly praising the bereavement services that we provide for uh, families and loved ones who lose um, with an early termination. So I met Bess Bessie Scrivens um, yesterday and she, she does wonderful work. Um, we Absolutely. should all be very proud of our maternity team. But what would you like to pull out of this report, Lorraine? Thank you, and, and thank you for that, that lovely comment. I will feed that back to the team. They've been working so hard. Um, so I'll take the report as read. So I, it, as I said, it's been a very busy month, but I'd like to say that our still birth rate remains well below the national average at 1.8. Um, we are doing lots of work around Ockenden and our compliance is improving month on month. Uh, we uh, submitted our CNST compliance. Um, unfortunately, we did not reach the 10. We reached five, but we were very assured with the five that we uh, submitted and have got plans going forward to uh, achieve the 10. We've also had a, a resubmission of our Saving Babies Life compliance to the national team. And we're really pleased that we've maintained our status of three out of five compliance. The other two areas are around preterm birth clinics and uterine artery dropplers and they are reliant on our colleagues across um, the, the system to support with that so that has delayed our progress but we we are working really hard to achieve those as well. Um, our, I think the thing that I'd like to really point out is um, although it's a moving feast but our midwifery vacancy is at zero and um, so that's really pleased us that uh, uh, <laughs> uh, midwives want to come and work with us and obviously we're doing lots of work to maintain uh, our, our midwifery and healthcare assistants and obstetricians at well-being and at work. Uh, we've got uh, uh, three business cases going through at the present, one around uh, refurb refurbishment of our theatres, one about uh, theatre staffing to make sure that um, we are safe and our midwives aren't scrubbing in theatre so we've got adverts out and support with agency practitioners for recovery and scrub um, and also business case um, around our obstetric um, workforce. Um, those are the main things that I would like to point out. Uh, anything? Oh, I suppose the other thing I'd like to actually add is our PPH rate. So we've done a lot of work. We were an outlier across the region um, and we've done a lot of work and a big uh, audit into looking at the reasons why. And I'm really pleased to say that actually um, looking at January's dashboard, we are now below the uh, the average. We went down to 1.7. So great hard work for the team to achieve that compliance. So those are the main points I'd like to pull out and happy to take any questions. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Lorraine. And um, just for members of the public, I'm the non-executive director champion for uh, maternity services and David Sprague and I, uh, uh, if every six weeks or so, try and either visit the uh, service uh, physically or digitally. And every time I go, I'm immensely proud of, of the team there. David, um, uh, sorry to sort of swing this on you, but uh, are you assured? I know we're both men in a, um, a world of... Um, of women, so to speak, on this issue. But um, uh, how are you feeling as chair of clinical governance regarding our mat uh, maternity services? I, I, I'm pretty pretty well assured. I have to say the improvements in in the last year, in particular, have been considerable. Um, and you know, going on the the PPH issue, that was something that caused me some concern uh, at the end of last year. But actually, there's been a you know a real 
a lot of work done on that. One, to address the issue, but also to identify and get the issue uh, properly recorded, I think is fair to say. So um, certainly uh, that's that's something that I, I, I got assurance on at the last governance meeting uh, last month. So yeah, so yeah, I think that, as you say, Russell, they're, they're, they're great. And probably the most important thing is the staff all seem remarkably happy. Um, their, their morale is really positive. Um, and that's got to be worth, you know, worth, worth everything, isn't it? Well said, David, thank you. Any yeah. other questions to Lorraine or perspectives? Keep up the great work, keep delivering those healthy babies for us, uh, Lorraine and team, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. And so we'll move on then to the Capital Programme Quarterly Update Report. Uh, Jenny, uh, what would you like to pull out of this? Um, thank you. So um, just to note, we're, we're coming to the end of what's been another high pressure year for the Capital Programme. Um, and We continue to deliver at pace in, as we go into the last month of, 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 the, of the year. Um, Kim's already touched on the finances and, and the plans to in terms of the carryover, so, so I won't go back over that. Um, key points in terms of delivery to note. So for Ellen Badger, we're pleased to confirm that we'll be moving into the next phase of construction next month. Um, also pleased to highlight the SIL funding we've received for the project from Stratford District Council. Um, for the Cath Lab, we are reporting a rephase of the programme due to delays from both the contractor and subcontractor perspective. Um, so completion is now due on that in September. Uh, we are working through uh, the reasons for those delays with, with the team um, and any subsequent impact um, on our specialties and we'll bring back any concerns to the board for, for assurance once that's complete. Um, finally, just to pick up on elective hubs, so that work is still progressing, we'll do have a paper in Confidential to discuss that further. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, any questions or perspectives to Jenny on the uh, capital programme quarterly update? Glenn? Good progress in what is quite a tricky space, actually, particularly with the way that the capital, the, the um, market for building such things as Ellen Badger, et cetera, is, has been so volatile. So I'm really pleased to see Ellen Badger project moving forward. Really pleased that we found a way of designing that that still allows the GP practice to join us at, at a future point and hopefully they, they still will. Uh, and the elective hub project um, is quite complicated but it, it's it's a, it's a really great way forward uh, and will deliver the sustainability of our uh, elective activity on Warwick site for years to come which is great. Yeah, absolutely Glenn, point well made. Colleagues happy to move on. So we'll then move on and we're at about page 280, I think, of the uh, board pack. Um, the green plan update. Back with you, Jenny. Uh, yep, so six, this is our six month update of the trust green plan and also update as to where we are with the integrated energy solution project. Um, so just to pick out, you'll see in the report lots of great progress being made against our green plan objectives, um, a couple of areas that we know we need to focus our attention on and we have plans in place um, to, to, to do that. Um, in terms of the integrated energy solution project, so we've submitted a grant application for 8.1 million um, to decarbonize, to begin decarbonizing our estate. Um, we expect to know the outcome of that um, mid-March. Uh, in parallel, we are progressing a tender exercise um, and we expect to bring back the outline business case to April Board of Directors for that. OK, great. Super. Thank you, Jenny. Any other points on the Green Plan update? OK, I think well, there's a question later about um, us using kilometres um, rather than miles in the some of the calculations. Um, that that is the recommendation we're going to do conversions going forward so that those of us who are old school miles type of people will understand the new generation's kilometres and vice versa. Um, if colleagues are happy, therefore, we move on to the Freedom to Speak Up Guardians report. And Deepa, lovely that you've been able to join us. Perfect timing. So Deepa, what would you care to pull out of the uh, uh, update report this time? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. So um, during this period, the uh, civility training has continued. But in addition to the regular training that we offer, we've also launched a 
um, a new training package as part of the manager's toolkit back in October, um, which is running every two months looking at tackling incivility. Uh, so that's encouraging managers to look at cultures within their teams, how they communicate and, and how we can challenge incivility with compassion. Uh, the two key areas that we've been involved in during this period are family health and the emergency division. Uh, so within family health, we've been conducting a deep dive, which has involved some meetings with individuals, focus groups, um, attending some meetings and the cultural barometer survey. That work's ongoing. We hope to have a final report within the next couple of months uh, to conclude that work. And then within the um, emergency division, um, our involvement there has come from a number of concerns that came through um, back in November of last year, um, following which um, an independent investigation has now uh, been commissioned and is well underway. Um, those concerns uh, were around a variety of issues, but mainly around culture and processes. Um, again, the investigator has been having one to one meetings, um, some small groups and attending some meetings uh, with some of the doctors, I understand as well, um, to get to grips with some of those issues. And that report as well is expected by the end of this month, I understand. Um, in terms of casework during this period, we've had 37 new cases. Um, a large proportion of those have come from our nursing colleagues, which ties in with the deep dive work that's been carried out within family health. Um, the themes and trends are across the board, um, but the main issues that have come through are around uh, relationships, attitudes and behaviours, um, incivility. Uh, but out of the, all of the cases uh, that cited those issues. Uh, there were six that uh, directly cited bullying and harassment, which is consistent with previous reporting periods as well. Um, some of the hotspot areas around those concerns are, again, within family health, but that would tie in with the deep dive work that's being conducted within that division. Some of the staff and uh, patient safety and experience issues have been around um, suitability of buildings, capacity due to staffing levels, uh, ratio of patients to trained nurses, and again, relationships with the teams and the impact that has um, are on the work that's being carried out. Um, we're continuing to see concerns around physical health, mental health, and also um, financial well-being, which would tie in with uh, the current financial um, crisis that people are experiencing and we've been able to signpost to the Financial Help Fund um, Employee Assistance Programme um, with staff in mind, uh, staff support. Um, so they're the key points that I wanted to draw out from the report. Happy to take questions. That's great. Thank you, Deepa. Um, you know, clearly we've been living through a few months of real challenge to all of the healthcare system and therefore our staff have taken the brunt of that. Um, what, what, what's your sense as to in, um, what, where we are given all of those pressures? Do you think we're in a pretty good situation regarding freedom to speak up or do you think we've got areas of real worry given the fact that everyone has been through such a nightmare? I'm just trying to get the balance of things deeper. How many times? Um, in light of the difficult uh, pressures that people have been under and the difficult few months that everybody has had, um, when we're actually being able to get into those areas and speak to people um, and they're having the opportunity to raise concerns, it's 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 having a, a definitely a positive impact. Um, so there are certainly areas where I would say there are still issues where People are maybe having trouble and not feeling completely safe to raise concerns, but there's certainly improvements that we're seeing and um, positivity in areas where the culture is actually really, really good. OK, Deepa, thank you very much. And thanks for your work day in, day out. And please pass on our thanks to Sue. Other questions and perspectives, Glenn? So I think testimony to, to Deepa and Sue for the way that they go about their role, for, for being accessible uh, and listening and advocating on behalf of staff and, and certainly being able to come to board and share uh, things in an unfettered way with us, I think is, is, is absolutely the right approach. One thing that will help to triangulate the question you just asked, Russell, is the National Staff Survey will be published in the next few weeks. And by the time we next meet the board, I think that will be in the public domain. 
There are some very specific questions in there about speak, speaking up, but also some wider um, uh, learning about staff engagement uh, and morale. Um, we will come out of that very well, but we will not be complacent in terms of it will still point some areas where we could make further improvements. That life's a journey, but you've got to make sure you're committed towards the uh, destination. And I think it is very important just to reiterate again to any colleagues who might be listening to this um, uh, in the future. Um, we uh, really want to encourage you to speak up. If you've got an anxiety about the way you're treated or patient safety or any other concern, please speak up. You can email me. You can go through the line. You can speak to Deepa and Sue. Um, but we want to have a culture of openness um, where civility does matter. It's taken as something which is a cornerstone of the way we behave towards one another because civility really does save lives. Adipa, thank you very much for your hard work. Keep up um, the, the, the great progress and thank um, you. keep us brief. Thank you very much. Um, then uh, on the Digital Health Board quarterly update, Anne, over to you. Thank you. Um, so the Digital Health Board under Adam's ABLE chairmanship um, has progressed a number of implementation projects really against the backdrop as we've uh, talked about in terms of the winter pressures. There is um, the report identifies and draws out the headline updates and significant areas of work. They're highlighted in the paper. There's also a forward look. And just for note, the changing in the reporting of the Registration Authority annual report, and that will go through the Innovate board meeting rather than uh, here to board of directors. So the recommendation is board of directors are asked to receive and to note this report. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Anne, and great, Adam, you're able to join us today for all of the board. Um, any questions or perspectives to Anne on that digital health update? OK, we'll move on then to uh, the report from the Council of Governors meeting held on the 9th of February, um, which is on page 309 of my pack, uh, which I will take as read. Um, very comprehensive um, uh, agenda for members of the public who weren't there um, with uh, very helpful updates from governor representatives on a whole series of projects which governors are involved in. Um, and uh, just as an aside, I am working uh, with governors about how we can uh, broaden um, the, 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 to use the Scottish phrase, the kirk of um, uh, voices that we hear um, in terms of our memberships and the citizens that we serve, which goes back to an earlier point I made about inviting Chris Baines um, from Health Watch Warwickshire um, to future board workshops. Um, are there any questions on that report from the Council of Governors meeting on the 9th of February? Just thanks again to the uh, enormous efforts of uh, our governors in a variety of different ways to the success of the Trust. Um, we're then on to the audit committee report for the 14th of December and the verbal report um, from the 8th of February. Um, Richard? OK, a lot of work's been going on in terms of making sure both external audits and internal audits all complete up to date. We had a few issues last year with illness, uh, especially at the external auditors, which meant things were behind. And also quite a few things were changed at the last minute, uh, but we've ironed all those out. We've had two very good internal audit uh, uh, reports, one on radiology utilisation, where uh, it, uh, significant assurance was provided. There were a couple of chunky bits around process there which are being ironed out. And then we also had another internal audit report on restoration and recovery, staff health and well-being. Again, we had significant assurance there as well, so that's pleasing to note. Um, Looking at next year, one of the areas we want to have a look at in the uh, internal audit uh, uh, and, and external audit is our report on uh, six monthly third party providers. And we've gone round everywhere in quite a few other places in the NHS. There seems to be no standard report. And having sat down and addressed it, we're going to look at that in the first quarter of this year because I don't think anybody's addressed the risk. You know, so risk like if you have a third party provider with IT, say the the, account, the payroll software, what happens if they go down? 
you know, what's our alternative? Those sort of risks aren't really being captured. So we're going through that. Um, and then one uh, additional thing, or two additional things. One thing I think is worthwhile uh, talking about the pressures on staff. Uh, we had the local security management annual report. And one of the disturbing things there is that there's been a significant increase in violence cases in the hospital. Um, we had 457 in the nine months from 1st of April to December. That's actually up nearly 200, 198 year on year. So that's quite significant. So lots of work's been done in terms of additional security cameras in uh, ED and also uh, giving people body cameras because it's well, well, well and good having a camera, but sometimes you need to capture verbal abuse if we're going to take it up with, with police. Um, so that's that's probably it. Thank you very much, Richard. And I'd just like to emphasize to members of the public that all of our staff are frontline and behind the scenes are there to do their best to try and help you. There is never an acceptable excuse for either emotional, verbal or physical abuse to any members of our teams. Um, any questions to Richard, please raise a digital hand. Thank you, Richard, and everyone involved in that hard work. And then on to the Clinical Governance Committee reports for the 14th of December, 11th of January and 8th of February. David Spraggart, over to you. Yeah, uh, I, I think I'll just take the reports as read. As I say, they, there's three three meetings uh, on the on the trot. Uh, so uh, the, lots of things were talked about. Um, just raise the issue of the areas of concern that are um, for the board. Um, and I'm actually really pleased to note that on the two of the areas of concern that I put on my last board report, Bhaskar has already ad addressed the uh, the mortality indicator and Lorraine and team have sorted the business case out. So uh, uh, whether they were listening or not, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, David. Um, any questions or perspectives to David? But that's, I think, a really great uh, high functioning committee. I get very good feedback, David, from uh, governors who attend and observe. So thank you. And uh, yeah. Basil, Lorraine and everyone involved in, it's, in that. It's the quality so, of the people attending. It's nothing to do with the chairmanship. I, I, I fully appreciate <laughs> that. That's my own view as to my chairing uh, contribution, David. Um, so we then move on to the Foundation Group Strategy Committee report for the 29th of November. Simon, anything you'd like to add? Uh, thank you, Russell. Now, I'll take the report as read and probably just to say, I think over the time, the group working has matured very well. And I think it's a great example now of working together to the benefit of all organisations. So long may that continue. Thank you very much, Simon. Any questions for Simon on that report? OK, we're then on to the risk management uh, portion of our board meeting. Thank you for everyone's sort of succinctness today, given the volume we've got to cover. Um, I think we're on about page uh, 323 of the pack. Um, the Board Assurance Framework and Risk Quarterly Report. Um, Anne? Thank you, Chair. This is the quarterly report, the Board Assurance Framework for the quarter three of um of, of, the, of this financial year and assurance uh for red rated risks those are risks rated uh, between 15 and 25 uh, risk scores on our divisional risk registers in my role as a senior responsible officer for the electronic patient records developed a new risk uh, relating to objective 13 which is the commencing the implementation of a new electronic patient record system and that is attached as appendix a the chief medical officer has identified an emerging low level risk for objective four embedding productivity and clinical efficiency uh, program not moving as quickly as anticipated um, the red risks on the divisional risk register is attached as, append as, attached, um, as appendix b for information um, the last risk management board met on the 12th of december 2022 it continues to meet uh, quarterly and is providing good assurance that the risk management processes are embedding within the divisions with movements of risks on and off the divisional risk register. So the board directs us to note the board assurance framework for 22-23 quarter three and to receive and note the red risks on the divisional risk register. Thank you, Chair. Very clear, thank you. And any questions or perspectives to Anne? 
Okay, Julie noted. Thank you, Anne. So we'll move on then to the summary of ratified policies. Um, Anne? Um, those are attached uh, for information. They were ratified by the Policy Review Group on the 19th of December. Happy to take any questions. Any questions to Anne on those ratified policies? Okay, so we've then got some things for noting and information. The first is the Emergency Preparedness, Resilience and Response, EPRR, Annual Report and Summary of Core Standards Compliance for 2022. That's a bit of a mouthful, um, 16 pages. Hakuma, what would you like to pull out? Um, just to thank the um, uh, staff, at EPRR staff um, who man the incident control room. I think um, I've probably said it before and certainly Helen before me in terms of the way that this is managed. Um, the requirement to have open access and inboxes manned sort of 24 hours a day and being stood up during times of operational pressure, I think is, is really challenging. There's um, only three individuals in the team. So, um, you know, it's sort of no mean feat to do every single return and sit rep that um, is required. So I just wanted to thank you um, to that um, team. Um, and the only thing to, well, the main thing to pull out is that for the first time we've been um, rated as non-compliant um, with the core standards. So usually we have um, a rating of substantial and that's primarily driven around the change in the way that the assessment for the core standards has been carried out. So um, all organisations are, are facing the same thing. We're by no means on our own and we're trying to work through as a system because the work around me to, um, de demonstrating the evidence against a lot of these standards is immense. So certainly the system work and the is there. And from April, we're going to um, change the way that we re review our policies through the emergency planning group um, rather than changing um, the whole trust um, uh, review of policies, which is what the recommended or requested um, course of action was. So this time next year, it will be back to being a different picture. Harkamal, thank you very much. Any questions or perspectives to Harkamal on the EPR annual report and summary of course standards? OK, thank you. Can you pass our thanks on to everyone who does the work behind the scenes, please? Um, Harkamal. So on to the Guardian Safe Working Annual Report, Pascal. Thank you, Chair. Notwithstanding the national tempers on junior doctors and uh, uh, strike threat, uh, I think this report I take the committee as having read. Uh, it's reassuring that our uh, the exception rating is actually trending downward, and the vacancy seems to be a uh, also on a downward trend, but vacancy continues to contribute to majority of our agency spend and locum spend. And while we see that a third of our shifts are covered by bank, two thirds agency is something that's such a low hanging fruit for us to invest and try and reverse that trend. And there are measures put in place to try and develop a centralization of junior doctor recruitment so that we are ahead of deanery, which often gives us a couple of weeks, a couple of months notice on who's coming and who's not coming. And we're also promoting an in-house clinical attachment program, which is honorary, but six weeks of testing out some existing staff to see what their potential is and try and start grow our own workforce. So that's reassuring. There hasn't been any fines raised, and there has been a bit of work by the Guardian to try and improve the frequency of weekend for our emergency staff from one in two weekends to one in three, and also the split between the trauma and orthopedics and gynecology, which I've always thought is a strange combination to be on call for together, has been very welcomed by a lot of juniors because a lot of agency was also linked to the fact that there weren't that many trainees keen to do both those. You know, gynae and ortho just doesn't add up together. So that has been a success since August 2022. And of course, we are met with some challenges with the GP rotations becoming four month long, which means that there is a lead time and we don't quite reap the reward, which used to be six months. You know, you could invest in three, four weeks of getting them used to a team and get some reward for five months, but that is now turning over faster. But like I said, there is a, a full awareness of where the issues are and a lot of initiatives being put so that we a stay resilient and hopefully start addressing some of the agency spend. Thank you. Yeah, very clear. Thank you, Bhaskar. And um, uh, clearly, just for members of the public, um, there is an awful lot of work going on behind the scenes to um, uh, find the best way through um, on the junior doctor strike and the implications of it. We have 
uh, immense sympathy to all of our staff at the moment, but um, uh, our primary concern needs to be making sure that we're able to protect our citizens on a day in day out basis. Um, any questions or perspectives to Basco? OK, thank you very much. So I think we're then on to the updated register of directors and register of directors interests a piece. Uh, so let. Thank you. Um, so both registers have been updated to remove Rosemary Hyde, who stood down as non-executive director. Um, so just for receiving a noting, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions or perspectives on that? OK, so we're then just signing off on some uh, full committee minutes. Um, those from the uh, audit committee on the 12th of October and the 14th of December. Richard, anything you'd like to add? OK, Julie noted. Any questions from colleagues? Thank you, Richard. And then the Clinical Governance Committee of the 9th of November, 14th of December and 11th of January. David, um, anything you'd like to add? No, no, nothing at all, thanks. Thank you. Anything from colleagues? Otherwise, we'll just note. OK, so I think we're on to any other business uh, colleagues. So please raise a digital hand from the Board of Directors if there's any other business. OK, just to thank Anne again and wish her well. So we're then on to questions from members of the public. Um, we've had one in the chat box um, from Roger Lloyd, um, which asks uh, the question, in the light of the reduction in the funding of the Community Diagnostic Hub, does this threaten the delivery of the hub? Glenn? Uh, no. Um... Uh, and, and what Kim was referring to earlier was was a was an in-year income assumption. Um, obviously, we're we're in the process of setting plans for the coming year, uh, and uh, there potentially will be further opportunities to to bid for capital and revenue around community diagnostic centres. Um, and we'll 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 make sure we use our capacity in balancing our income and expenditure. So this is more of a an issue this year, but it's not stopping us doing what we plan to do. Okay, super, thank you. And I think, um, Sir Collette, Roger had a, a question regarding the green plan and the use of kilometres rather than miles, but hopefully, Roger, I addressed that when we talked about the green plan. So, um, thank you. Are, are there any other questions um, from members of the public? Please raise a digital hand. OK, I can't see any digital hands raised, so we've obviously um, shot you into silence, um, but we uh, look forward to um, seeing you at our, our next board, which is on just checking my dates, the 5th of April. Um, so just two days after my daughter's 22nd birthday. So I'll be celebrating just before the board. We look forward to seeing you all on the 5th of April. In the meantime, um, can I suggest we have a 10 minute comfort break and get into the confidential board because we've got quite a lot to cover. And um, thank you to uh, members of the public who have persevered reading the full board pack and apologies again for it being quite so substantial. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care, everyone.